Hey everyone, Dan Gorgone from Treehouse here, and I'm at the In Control Conference in Orlando, and I'm here with Zoe Gillenwater, author. Zoe, thank you for coming, sharing your time. Thank you for having me. I wanted to ask you how you got started, because I know I, I looked at your bio, doing some research, and you're a freelancer, designer, developer. How did you get involved with all these things? How did you get started in the industry? Uh, well, I learned, first learned HTML when I was in high school, and I just thought it was fun to kind of play around with. Uh, but I needed a job in college, and so I got this job helping um, like do Blackberry sites for like professors who couldn't figure it out. And um, so that was kind of my first job in the web area. And um, I decided that I really liked it, and so I switched my major um, and uh, just started, you know, kind of focusing on making web design my career from there. So when you were in high school and taking HTML, is that something that you immediately clicked with you? And is that something that you can see being useful for other students in high school, maybe even younger, taking language courses like that? Yeah, I think so. I did definitely have kind of a connection with it. And um, I think it was a couple of years ago, I taught this um, homeschool class. So, you know, a collection of people who were doing homeschooling wanted to offer like electives to their kids. And so um, I did this web design elective basically for like, um, I think they were like middle school age kids. And um, it was really fun to see how a few of them were like really into it. Like they really got it and they were going and doing way more than I gave them for homework every week. Yeah. Um, so I like that HTML is so simple. You can pick it up really fast and you can produce something really quickly. And it you know may not look awesome to us snooty web designers, but it's cool that anybody, it's so accessible to so many different people. So would you say that, I mean, for kids and adults alike, that HTML is a good way to get started with design, with learning how to do websites, or, you know, is there something new these days? I think it's best if you know it. So you can, I think you can be a, a good web designer um, who just, you know, who learns, who comes at it from the graphic design end of things. So you learn all the design principles and that, you know, um, carries you through web design as well. But if you know the, you know, the structure of how your, act, your design is actually going to be built, it gives you a better understanding of how to design for the strengths of that and avoid, you know, potential tricky things that are hard to do, you know, when, you're, when it comes to actually building the page. So I think you, you don't have to know HTML or CSS, but I think it's really helpful to know those things. Well, you gave a great talk this morning about CSS3 mm -hmm. and how a lot of the best practices, a lot of the tips and tricks for the people in the audience. Uh, how has CSS3 changed the way that front-end design happens these days? I think one of the big ways it's changed front-end design is that this whole design in the browser idea is a lot more possible. It's now possible to get immediately into the HTML and the CSS and start playing around with things to see how they look, trying out different styles. I think it, it, it kind of can create just a lot more kind of speed of getting going on a new design. You know, opposite end of that, sometimes it can be kind of limiting. If you're only designing in the browser, you may never try out different things that would require images to do rather than just CSS3. Um, so I think, you know, you can use both tools, but I think that's one of the great things about it is that it, it does get us away from using as many images, which is great for a whole number of reasons, you know, performance uh, being a big one. And, um, and mobile as well. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's great for, yeah, mobile as well, not having so many resources to download and all that stuff. Is thinking mobile first, like designing for mobile first, is that really the way that design should be done these days? Is, is that the way that we should think about it in design, is mobile first? It's, it's a lot more of a, um, not so much of a linear process. So I think some, sometimes when people talk about mobile first, it's important to remember that we still don't want it to be totally linear where we're not thinking about desktop experience when we're designing mobile experience. So I like the idea of thinking mobile first, um, 
with kind of the caveat of also keeping in mind desktop and things like that. So it's a lot more iterative and not so much of that waterfall development process. So you wouldn't just you know, design mobile and then say, OK, got mobile down. Now I'm going to design you know, desktop. Um, so you're kind of doing them all together at once. Well, I know you've also done a lot of research on accessibility. Mm -hmm. And it seems like if there's anything that's kind of universal, it's uh, the, the best practices behind accessibility. Yeah. How has that informed your design uh, process and your design decisions? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I definitely see accessibility as something that is not optional. It's not like something that I would charge a client extra for. Or it's not a feature, it's just how things should be done. So it is something that I keep in mind whenever I'm designing. You know, a lot of it's simple stuff like not having really small text or, you know, making sure that the color contrast, contrast is, uh, you know, easy to read, things like that. And some of it is bigger design decisions because a lot of these interactive widgets that, um, you know, we have on our pages now, there are ways to make them accessible, but a lot of times that can be really difficult or it may, you know, even the accessible version may not be as good of a user experience. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should think about designing a different, you know, interface that um, more people can all interact with instead of this interface is so targeted towards people who, um, you know, have sight or are really good with their fingers and whatever. Mm -hmm. So You've recently written uh, about mobile accessibility, mm -hmm. which I know uh, for some people they may not um, make the connection between accessibility and mobile, like how uh, would I be able to design something that say a, uh, you know, a blind person would be able to use on a, on a mobile site mm -hmm. or even mobile apps. How, how does mobile accessibility change things for designers out there, or does it change things at all? Is it really just the same best practices? Um, it's mainly the same best practices. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the technical details about how you would achieve them would be different on mobile, but the kind of overarching ideas and, and um, goals you're going for would be the same, as well as just you know structuring your HTML, having that semantic HTML and, and things like that. That foundation applies to mobile as well. I think mobile accessibility is so important because mobile devices are actually a really great tool for a lot of people with disabilities that allow them to do so many things that they weren't able to do before, or weren't able to do easily before. And so when we create websites or web apps that don't, um, don't allow them to accomplish those tax, tasks, it's even, it's even harder on them because they've, they've got this device that now lets them do all of these new things they couldn't do before. They're excited about that, but then your website like stops them. So um, I, I kind of feel like mobile accessibility is, is really you know, important and it is something that most people don't really think about. I know something I noticed when I hand my iPad to my two boys who are both under the age of seven mm -hmm. is that they don't know exactly how it works, but they're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, what apps that are built for kids, especially, uh, you will figure out the problems almost immediately yeah. with interface and the accessibility of apps. Um, and you have kids of your own? Yeah. Have I, you I, seen that as well? Have you noticed yeah. that they, you know, just the way that they go through things, that they kind of figure things out and they highlight the mistakes of, of other designers immediately? Yeah, absolutely. I have, I've totally noticed that as well. <laughs> Some parting thoughts for you, uh, or parting thoughts for our audience. We've talked about accessibility, CSS3, uh, and design. How can people stay current with this ever-changing landscape of of coding and design and, and everything else. What do you do to, to stay current? Yeah, it, it is hard to stay current. Um, I rely on Twitter a lot to just get all of this new information. Um, so I read a lot of blogs, but I kind of find out about them through Twitter. I think that that's a really great tool because you can see what is on people's minds right at that moment. They don't have to take a long time to craft some big, long blog post. You can see what other designers and developers are thinking about and working on right at that moment. 
And um, I think a lot of staying current too is just being willing to just try something new. So um, recently, I just tried SAS for the first time. And I hadn't used a CSS preprocessor before just because, I mean, I've been doing CSS forever and it works, right? I'm, I'm used to writing it. And, and so I can just write it and I'm fine without a preprocessor. So I, I, I had never taken the time to, um, to learn that. But I finally just was like, you know, I'm just going to give this an hour, right? Mm -hmm. And try it out. And I really enjoyed it. So a lot of times I think we think that we have to devote like, okay, now I'm going to learn JavaScript and I'm going to take the next six months to do that. Like, don't think about it that way. Just think about, I'm just going to learn something, one new thing in this hour, mm -hmm. you know, and just try something new and see what one new thing you can learn. Or sometimes you can take less time and go to treehouse.com, teamtreehouse.com <laughs> and learn it on there. Yeah. So, all right, well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Um, author Zoe Gillenwater sharing her time here at the In Control Conference in Orlando. Thanks for watching here on Treehouse Friends. We'll see you next time.